I've decided to do some short stories. The one that I'm going to read to you now, I did the first two pieces of the short story at not the last open mic, but the one before that. Now I've finished the piece, and this is the first hearing of this piece in Laps. It's called Comes in Threes. It's slightly semi-autobiographical. I come from a very small one-cow village, as you would say in German. Um, that's near Sheffield. Everyone said Jim was a great guy. With his large back garden, there was a beehive of activity. He had a converted coal house and a tool shed that was used by local kids for electrical and mechanical tinkering. Full of parts, components, bits and bobs of used or in repair gadgets, bikes and the like. Kids would come around to learn how to use the array of tools or take them out to those in need for DIY, maintenance, quick fixes or odd jobs in the neighbourhood. At intervals in the year, except in winter when the soil suffered from its very own frostbite, kids could be seen sowing or picking their own fruit and veg in his, typical for the village, large family garden. Right down the back of the garden, Peter Pan, Elven, or goblin-like dens and tree houses had been built around and in the two fruitless trees. The kids knew to leave the others alone for better scrumping from August to mid-September for brownie and cox apples. Likewise, William's pears scrumped from mid-August to October. Sim Simon found the coxes and brownies a little bit too bitter. But the juicy, speckled green pears had moorish, pale insides with a fleshy feel to them when you bit down hard and the sappy, pulpy, yummy juices dribbled onto your chin. One late Indian summer, under the heat of weighted thoughts, he wondered just why fruit insides were called flesh. He could only just about imagine what it would be like to be a cannibal. As he found it, human flesh must be a bit tougher than the soft fruit flesh, especially if the person's a little bit well bent or plump as a plum. Number one, flicking fresh peas from pods. Simon had delicate hands that he did not mind getting dirty in and among the weeds and roots of the garden. But the excitement built up when pea picking time pinching the pods from the vine, tracing his thumbnail down the middle of the pods and splitting, spreading the pods ready for the pick. For him, nothing beat holding the edge of the pod in a thumbs up shaped hand and taking that thumb and running it along the length of the pod to flick the peas into the metal colander. The bonus encore was a tenor pod, full of small, succulent, fresh peas that ended up chasing each other round and round the metal wire funnel rim until they settled in a heap with their pod pea buddies. He even trimmed and manicured his nail to be the best tool for the job. And this would serve him well when he used it later in life to pluck guitar strings. Most of the young kids loved to get dirty digging the spuds out of the ground or fishing out the grubs from the full-headed broccolis collies and cabbages. But for Simon, nothing beat picking peas. Jim showed him how to sneakily hide from bee eyes, the smaller ones, with the cup of his hand to snack on later. Jim explaining, keep the fresh ones, get rid of the shriveled up, bitter, bad and stale ones, kiddo. For Simon, the garden was not only an educational playground, but one for the rough and tumble of battles fought out with his toy soldiers, his action force figures, and even between the smaller, more expensive Transformer ar armies of the Autobots and the Decepticons, his family could barely afford, but he saved up all his paper and milk round money for them. There was a no man's land near the back of the wall where the hose piped up was an upturned crate, and the seasonal, varying in size, soap bars. Only as he got older 
and his smurf worlds turn into garden staged battles, did he wonder just why the soap was there? Even at the cold snap and thaw end of winter. In his uni years, Steve, his estranged uncle, told him, Jim, now he's a proud man, probably washed and scrubbed up at back at house after our graft out mines, so no speck of grime and dirt could be seen on him when he came in house like. This ticked off one of the many open questions that were left unanswered and cut short by Jim's cancer. Number two, catching snowflakes on the tip of your tongue during the powder dusting of a second or third snowfall. In his childhood, it seemed that there was more and ever more snow around, deeper, thicker, and whiter. But maybe it was because he was smaller more easily impressed by thick white carpeting. Running out of snow for his snowman was never a problem, even when he needed a stool assist for his short round legs so he could top off the head with a makeshift stuffed carrier bag hat. Coal for eyes, a three button jacket, a mangled carrot for the nose, and pedals for the grinning teeth of the mouth. In his later teens, he would build from snow the same kind of castles on Orchard Avenue Hill that he built in sand at the beach on the east coast. Trying to outdo each by a larger scale every time and then going all the way back down to miniature again, using cardboard, wood, lollipop sticks and his Uncle Jet's wide, wide windscreen wiper scraper as tools to sculpt the turrets, moats, drawbridges, fortifications and towers. In autumn, the top of Orchard Avenue was used for kids' versions of parachuting. A bunch of the kids would get the anoraks or such like winter coats of their larger relatives, unzip them and opening them at arm's length, shoot wide, perch on the edge of where the road met the hill on the curb, toe teetering, waiting for the wind to pick up enough of the gust to lift them off their feet topple them over, or if they were really lucky, carry them off and drift their fall down the hill. But in winter, the hill was used for sledging, and for Simon, something completely different. He would hold his arms out, exposed palms, so his body formed an arrow pointing towards where the snow was coming from. His head tilted back, and with his tongue stuck out, Wait for a snowflake or two. Once when doing this, he nearly bit the end of his tongue off. A heavy adult hand tapped him on his left shoulder, but no one was there. Automatically, his first thought was fear of being in the wrong. After all, he was very young. But as Simon turned his head to the right, he saw Jim playfully mirroring his stance. They stood there for fleeting moments, waiting for the cold tingle on the left tongue tips. To Simon, it seemed like those precious few minutes elongated into an eon. Time like the granddaughter clock in their house stuck hands at quarter past nine. As Jim brought him under his wing and taking him back up Orchard Avenue, he rounded off with, you know, each and every flirt is different and unique, but just like us, each and every one's made of the same stuff, son. Number three. Finding solace under a weeping willow. This old tree was like an honorary auntie or godmother, cocooning him in his trailing to the floor branches in times of trouble. As dinner was waiting for him at his house at the other end of the village, he knew he would be in the doghouse if it, got, if it got cold, but he did not really care right now. Sporting a black eye and a bloody nose, he sat with his skull tie loosened and his satchel curled as much in a ball as he was. His thoughts dragged on for what seemed like forever in his small shut off world. But all the thoughts, despite getting messy and lost in the maze of memory, rushed back to the simple question why? 
as he drew a hedgehog face with a stick in the top sole underneath the wid widow willow. That distinct, pungent soap, soap smell hit his nostrils, bringing him back to Jim's garden. The willow vine branches were drawn back like a bamboo porch bead curtain. His companion sat next to him and sighed in almost understanding. Sitting there quietly, Simon did not quite know what to say or what to do, so he remained stunned. Jim started to whistle, three bars in what Simon recognised to be a strange old ditty. Not been a brazzle-dazzle day for Simon so far, but a smile came to his face when he recalled the film Pete's Dragon, where the song came from. Picking his satchel up and putting it on his shoulder, Jim broke the silence. You ready? He led him up the garden towards the back door. You know, kiddo, kids and adults can be real cruel. The taunts and the beatings was enough for Simon to not question the self-evident statement. They passed the dens, the scrumping trees, the vegetable patch bare of collies, cabbages, and picked peas. Just as they got to the upturned crate and the glistening wet soap bar, Jim stopped, turned him around slowly by the shoulders, and clenching and unclenching his fists, said, not what you use these for, touched his head, not what pops out of ear, and tapping Simon's uniform blazer breast pocket with his worn and weathered middle finger, but what you free from there and hold in there. He could never say Jim held true to the norm of a real man's man, not really macho or tough in that hard man's way. But to Simon, he was the real man, and only if his memory remained at his side. For embedded and engraved in his mind since the age of eight, when Jim left him suddenly, there was that triptych. Number one, keep the fresh ones, get rid of the shriveled up, bitter, bad, and stale ones. Number two, each and every one is different and unique, but just like us, they are all made up of the same stuff. Number three, what you use your hands and your fists for, what comes out of your head, but it's what you free from here and hold in your heart.